This chap chapter is going to cover feeding and eating disorders. So I'm not really going into the elimination disorders on this one. Um, so we're going to mainly look at anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorders. Looking at the clinical picture for each of these, um, anorexics or people who have anorexia, um, lots of times they refuse to eat. Uh, they want to maintain a small, you know, this certain weight. Um, so, and they have a lot of fears of, you know, gaining weight. Uh, when we think of anorexia, it's the loss of appetite, and usually this is not what's happening. What they're doing themselves is restricting their food intake, and so uh, they just don't want anything to eat. Uh, they have this fear um, of gaining weight. Their their body image when they look in the mirror is much different than what we actually see. Um, they'll restrict their calories. And uh, again, if they feel like they ate too much, they will, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, make themselves uh, purge. But mainly it's the restriction of the calories, making sure that they don't eat uh, anything to gain weight. And they will also do excessive exercise to make sure that they're not gaining weight. The bulimia is usually episodes where they have this binge eating and then they have this uncontrollable urge to just eat, 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 and then they go and they either purge, uh, they take laxatives, diuretics, and excessive exercise to make sure that they do not uh, gain any weight. And lots of times it's hard to tell because many times they have a normal looking body, you know, weight. They're not skin and bone like the, uh, the patient with the anorexia. Um, so again though, they um, still may have some type of dis you know, um, uh, disorder where they just feel like they you know, have no control over something and they, they're trying to figure out about their, you know, uh, their body image and their self image more so than um, how they physically look. But you know, look at their self image, but sometimes they could control it by using their body to help compensate. When you have the binge eating, these individuals have these huge episodes where they just cannot get enough to eat, and then they feel very uh, guilty about it afterwards, and they're you know embarrassed about it, and they you know they just feel disgusting afterwards, and they don't understand why they did it at the time, but they'll have these repeated binging uh, episodes, and sometimes it's hard to tell if this is from a binge eating episode or if it's someone who has a poor diet. Here we're going to look at the etiology of these eating disorders. Uh, they have found that there is a uh, genetic link that's quite strong for eating disorders. There's also, through genetics, um, individual, individuals can have the vulnerability to uh, have a poor impulse control and affect. Or they say it could be also due to some type of um, underlying uh, neurotransmitter that's not functioning properly. However, they have not been able to find a single gene that they can identify and say, yes, if you have this gene, you will end up with an eating disorder. Um, neurobiologically, they're saying there could be an alteration in the serotonin function um, that contributes to um, this dysregulation in appetite, moods, and impulse. With the neurological or neurobiological um, factors, again, as I said, there's altered uh, uh, alteration in the function of serotonin, serotonin in the brain, and this can contrib contribute to the, you know, their irregular appetite, mood, and impulse control that people have with eating disorders. Um, there's a nice little uh, paragraph there talking about tryptophan and how uh, they is seeing how that is also regulated because again tryptophan uh, is uh, only available through the diet and so um, when you have a normal diet this is going to boost the serotonin in the brain and regulates their moods and of course um, there will be drops uh, in the serotonin when they start to um, have less calories and become malnourished. 
as far as uh, psychological factors, um, you know, a lot of times uh, in the past and back in the 70s and early 80s, they believed that it was a defense mechanism where people were feeling overwhelmed. They felt powerless and ineffective. Maybe they were, there was a lot of uh, pressure put on them by the parent or um, just some society. And now they're seeing that uh, there's more cognitive behavioral theorists that are saying that a lot of times this is some type of learned behavior um, and that they're getting the um, positive reinforcement by someone telling them, oh, wow, you look great, you're really getting skinny, and then they keep wanting to do it more and more, and it starts to reinforce them um, to keep wanting to and uh, striving to lose that weight. Uh, so they really haven't found a lot of research that determines any defini definitive family characteristics that are specific to the eating disorders. Um, when you look at environmental factors, um, a lot of people have studied that culture uh, may influence how we see ourselves, our self-concept, and our uh, satisfaction with our body size. And, of course, in the Western culture, they believe everyone who is beautiful has to be thin and, and tall. Um, they're now showing research that has not proven any kind of di um, direct link between social ideals that are portrayed by the media and the development of the di eating disorder. Um, they are saying that so that peer behaviors and attitudes may actually contribute to the body dissatisfaction, and that's usually what um, actually will start to trigger this, and lots of times it gets out of control. When we're looking at the assessment um, part of the nursing process when it comes to anorexia, on your assessment, you, you want to ask them, you know, you don't want to ask them, uh, the patient, if they feel fat. Um, because this is going to start to uh, make them focus in on the, the distortion of their body image. Um, so we want to focus on their eating patterns, such as, you know, what do you eat in a normal day? Those are some good questions. Um, doing a good blood work. Also in our assessment, we want to also, you know, look for signs of malnutrition. Um, you also want to think about, um, you know, some of the the uh, conditions and things that you're going to see with your patients um, when you look at some of the characteristics. Now, there are cases where they do have to be hospitalized, and if you look at Box 18.2 in your textbook, it actually tells you some of the conditions that warrant hospitalization. Um, we also um, want to make sure there's no other medical issues that have risen uh, from the, uh, from this eating disorder, and you know, we want to think about support groups and um, we need to think about t teaching and are they ready for, you know, help uh, for these conditions. If they're not compliant, it's not going to help. Um, so they, there are medical complications that do arise with these. And so we want to make sure that we're um, protecting our patient, looking out for their best interest. Um, if someone has the type of binge purge anorexia, um, they may actually show those severe electrolyte imbalances because as they purge, they're losing more and more of their nutrients uh, that supplies um, the uh, their electrolytes. The patients who have the restricting type of anorexia, you'll see them as being severely underweight, and you won't see this till they actually take their clothes off. Uh, and then they may have... Um, some facets of like a newborn called lanugo, uh, which is the little fine downy hairs on their face and their back. Uh, their skin a lot of times are mottled. Um, they're very cool to the extremities because they don't have any subcutaneous fat. Uh, they'll have low blood pressure, low pulse, and uh, their temperature will actually be low. They'll actually be um, malnourished and dehydrated. Um, so they do have possible signs and symptoms of anorexia nervosa in your textbook, and there's a table, 18-1, that actually goes into a few other things that you'll see and why they're showing these symptoms. Um, main thing we want to know about is their eating habits and their history and the perception of their problem. Um, and then also, you know, what is the value of their body shape and weight to them? Um, just trying to get an idea uh, what's going on. With the nursing diagnosis, there's several ones, and of course the one that pops out should be um, 
you know, uh, imbalance nutrition, less than body requirements. Also to their, you know, cardiac issues, so decreased cardiac output, risk for injury, um, uh, risk for imbalanced fluid volume, and so forth, as far as your diagnoses. And then you have your uh, psychological diagnosis, such as disturbed body image, ineffective coping, chronic low self-esteem, and powerlessness. For our outcomes, uh, the body image disturbances are considered improved or resolved when the patient is consist consistently satisfied with his or her own appearance and body function. Um, and again, this is some subjective information. Um, in the planning, um, we, when a patient has anorexia and they ex experience that extreme electro light imbalance or weighs less than 75% of their ideal body weight, our most important thing is to get them medically stabilized. One of the things that they do is called uh, refeeding. So when they start eating, we ne need to look at something um, that can actually be a detriment to them, and it's known as the refeeding syndrome. Um, this happens when there is a too rapid of a weight gain that can actually overwhelm the heart, and this can actually lead to a cardiovascular um, collapse of the patient. Once we do have the patient medically uh, stable, we do want to address issues of that underlying uh, disorder. Um, so with this refeeding, one thing you want to think about, a weight gain of more than two to five pounds a week can actually overwhelm the heart's capacity to pump and that can lead to that cardiac failure. So you think two to five pounds a week, you know, that's not a whole lot, especially the, around the, you know, in, down towards the lower end of the scale, such as the two pounds, but it can be a detriment to their body and to the heart. Um, let's go on to the next slide. I think this slide is interesting because you may have someone who looks like a one, but when they look in the mirror, they see themselves as a nine. So they do have that distorted body image. You know, we're all, we come in all shapes and sizes. And so, but some people, that's how they judge themselves. That's how they gain their own self-concepts and see themselves is an image, but it's an image that's distorted. With the interventions with anorexia, um, a patient can become severely underweight. So they're gonna have that low blood pressure, they're gonna have a low pulse and low temperature, they're gonna have signs of dehydration, that low uh, serum potassium, and they'll probably have, be having some dysrhythmias. Um, anorexia can be treated inpatient or outpatient, which is to help them to maintain their you know, healthy body weight their eating produces high anxiety for them, and their anxiety levels need to be lowered if the patient is ever going to be successful in attaining some type of therapeutic goal. So they try to make it pleasurable areas for them to go eat. Um, if they're admitted into a hospital in a crisis state, the initial focus, of course, is to um, get them stable. Also, too, we want to know if they have any type of su um, suicidal thoughts um, we definitely need to address those as well. We also want to establish some trust and monitor their eating pattern. Um, based on their height, um, a treatment goal is set at usually around 90% of their ideal body weight, or of the ideal body weight. And this is where, uh, this is actually the weight in which for women that they will menstruate. We usually see anorexia more in women um, than we do in men. Um, again, patients begin to refeed, and then they participate in MALU therapy. Um, they need to make sure that they're feeling, we need to make sure that they're feeling accepted and safe, and no one's judging them by the amount of food they're putting in their mouth. Um, we want to focus on their eating behavior and any anxieties that they feel, dysphoria, um, you know, do they have, you know, lack of control, low self-esteem, discuss their appearance. But we have to be very careful to approach that very carefully. Um, when you have um, your patients, 
with this, um, you know, lots of times we think, oh, well, I'll just give them a medication. Well, there are no drugs that are approved for anorexia. Um, now, they do sometimes will give them an SSRI, such as a, a Prozac type of drug, um, once they've reached uh, their maintenance weight. Um, and so this can, you know, help them to not be so anxious. Um, unconventional antipsychotics can be given, such as Zyprexa, and this can help to improve their mood and decrease those obsessive behaviors and that resistance um, that, uh, you know, where they're wanting to resist gaining any weight. Um, however, it's not very acceptable because among patients because one of the major side effects of this is um, weight gain. So, you know, that is definitely an issue uh, for them as soon as you tell them some of the side effects that they may see. If you have a patient with bulimia nervosa, um, on the assessment, um, some things we want to do, again, our priority, of course, is medical stabilization um, because we worry about with all the purging, their electrolytes, their fluid balance, and cardiac function. Uh, so they need a complete medical exam um, as soon as they come in um, and to run these tests to make sure that uh, they're not at risk. Uh, on the assessment, um, usually they don't appear physically or emotionally ill. Uh, until you look actually, um, they often um, look really close to their body weight that they should be. Um, physical emotional pro problems are usually the most apparent. One of the things that you'll see is an enlarged parotid gland, and this is usually from the vomiting, induced vomiting. The other thing is a lot of uh, uh, dental uh, issues, such as um, cavities and, dent and like gum erosion uh, from the acid from the purging. Um, some of them will be rotted out, some of, them, some of the teeth will be missing. Um, in eight, box 18.5, they actually talk about some of the uh, medical complications that are involved uh, with the bulimia nervosa. Um, in, the, in their history, they may even have some impulsive or compuls compulsive behaviors. Um, lots of times, what we're seeing with these individuals is there's some family um, chaos in, in the relationships, and so they feel like they maybe not a lot of nurturing growing up, and so a lot of insta uh, instability and um, difficulties in their lives and their lifestyles. Um, they may even be depressed, um, have a poor concept of themselves, um, maybe even have some type of chemical dependency, anxieties, and so forth. Um, we do see these individuals using uh, laxatives and diuretics along with the uh, purging as well. Diagnoses are usually uh, things such as the decreased cardiac output um, because of the purging and the potassium level being thrown off. Uh, we'll also see um, uh, the um, disturbed body image, uh, ineffective coping, powerlessness, chronic low self-esteem, and social isolation. Um, if they are, if they do come in in uh, poor health because of the uh, uh, purging and the electrolyte imbalance, again, when they're in acute care, it's necessary um, that we look for those life-threatening complications. And some of those could actually even be gastric rupturing uh, from the binging and purging, and again, that electrolyte imbalance in those cardiac arrhythmias or dysrhythmias. In the planning portion, um, Again, we want to, um, um, you know, treat any life-threatening you know, uh, problems and also any uh, um, ideas of uh, suicidal ideations. I definitely want to um, address those. There's a table, 18.4, that talks about some of the uh, outcomes that you may want to identify for these individuals as well. Uh, with these patients, or with our interventions, we want to aim to interrupt that binge purge cycle. Um, and they may be in use psychotherapy and self-care as part of the treatment plan. Um, 
and then in the end, our long-term treatment is to address any, um, you know, uh, coexisting depression, substance abuse, personality disorders that may be causing this distress and interfering with their quality of life. Two issues that are useful for the patient to target is their self-worth and interpersonal functioning. Um, again, we look at cognitive and behavioral models of treatment, we, and they have been found to be very effective. And so, um, again, examining the underlying conflicts and body dissatisfaction, um, we also see the comorbidities, again, as uh, such as depression and substance abuse. Any pharmacological interventions, uh, antidepressant medications, along with the cognitive behavioral therapy, actually has helped some of these symptoms of bulimia. Um, Prozac uh, can help uh, reduce the chances of a re relapse. And then Wellbutrin uh, can be effective, but um, there is an induced uh, or increased risk of seizures. Um, so they don't um, uh, recommend this, especially for people who purge because of the choking risk that can be a, uh, come along with this. In um, health teaching, uh, patients um, need to be supervised um, at meals at homes and share their feelings um, that are provoked um, by others in group therapies. Um, so we need to be able to know that when they go and they eat a meal, that they're going to keep that meal down. And so they need to be supervised. Um, part of the teamwork and safety issues, of course, is that structured milieu um, environment and observing them during and after their me meals to prevent them from purging. Um, we want to normalize their eating patterns and uh, make sure they, they maintain just an appropriate amount of exercise and not overdoing it. Binge eating is... Um, kind of difficult sometimes to understand if someone has this disorder or not um, because there is obesity and obesity does put people at risk for different health issues which we're very familiar with and so it's people with binge aging eating do not need to be put in the hospital or be hospitalized unless they do have an issue that has actually come about because of the binge uh, eating um, so patients um, also who have this binge eating, because they are inhaling these large quantities of food, have gastrointestinal dilation. Um, they'll have difficulties with heartburn, dysphagia, um, bloating, abdominal pain. They may have uh, uh, diarrhea, constipation, and even anal blockage uh, due to this. Um, on the generalist uh, Assessment, they'll even have periods when their um, eating feels out of their control. Uh, they have no control over it and they just can't get enough and they consume a massive amount of food. The major challenge is, you know, to have an understanding about these individuals and realize that they're not just obese and just eating, they can't help it. Um, we also want to make sure that we get a careful history about the quantity of food that they consume. Um, in these binging episodes and how often they occur and this is how we can actually adjust our nursing care plan towards these individuals. Um, again, they do need a physical examination and blood work. We also want to try to figure out what are some of the triggers uh, for the binge eating and um, any other medical uh, conditions that might be happening. Uh, on the diagnosis, we're going to look at imbalanced nutrition, more than body acquirement requirements, disturbed body image, ineffective coping, anxiety, uh, chronic low self-esteem, powerlessness, and isolation. Um, let's see. Also, um, outcomes identifications. Again, they have this purple box down below uh, on page uh, 357 that talk about some of the outcomes that are um, that we want to reach depending on the symptoms and the diagnosis so you can look at those I won't read those to you uh, as far as planning um, we want them to have a usual diet and exercise um, to allow them for some you know as you know for some weight loss 
One major difference, though, with the binge eating is the complication um, of it when it arrives when they, you know, have this mode and they go into this large volume of um, food that they take in. So it, it can be a little difficulty when that happens because then as they're trying to lose weight, all of a sudden the stomach is just completely dilated and the whole gas, and then they start to have all the gastrointestinal problems again. When it comes to acute care, hospitalization is not actually needed. Uh, treatment is usually in, in an outpatient setting. So uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is uh, a really good treatment um, that's been used to reduce the number and the severity of the binge eating. Um, you know, effective treatment for obese patients is binge abstinence. That's what we want them to do, just to not you know, have these episodes improving their depressive symptoms and then hopefully helping them to achieve some type of appropriate weight. Because of their um, efficacy uh, with bulimia and use of SSRIs at or near the in, uh, high end of a dosage range, it's been studied that um, this uh, can help them in the short term with binge eating. They do have some other medications that they're looking at and trying to understand how well they work. Um, there is a medication called uh, locus, uh, Lorcaserin, and it helps people to feel full um, after eating smaller meals. And what it does, it blocks appetite signals that can actually go to the brain. Um, and so they are trying this. Um, it actually activates the serotonin receptor in the, in the brain. And so they, they're trying this in combination with exercise in a reduced diet. And um, they are getting some success. Um, in health teaching and promotion, um, they're struggling on how to use food um, to not regulate their mood and learn how they can use other coping strategies. Um, and once they've had abstinence um, with the binge eating, they may focus to start changing their body weight by slow and um, and steady uh, weight loss that can actually help them and help them to maintain it and keep it off.